out of this classroom and eat the rest of those donuts. <laughs> so, um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Colonel Lampy. He's a state aviation officer. Um, he's, he's the big guy in charge of all the aviation. Um, he, he runs the flight board and provides recommendations. So, uh, please welcome Colonel Lampy. Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning sir. I appreciate, uh, first of all, all of you taking the initiative to come to the Iowa Army Aviation Symposium. So it's a big step, and a lot of it's uh, just getting out the door, right? Showing up at the block. So you showed up at the blocks, and now you can start seeing and educating yourself on what it takes to become a uh, United States Army Aviator. Um, Iowa, uh, I'll tell you, we're one of the best programs in the nation. And I can say that because we are ranked in the nation, right, across the board. Um, flying our program, uh, maintenance, it isn't just about flying the aircraft, okay? So it's about the maintenance program, the safety of our program. And so I've assembled a team with the RRB here to talk to you, and really our job here is to get to know you. So I want you to understand that. We're going to ask tough questions. We're going to talk to you. But our job is to get to know you. Uh, this is a process. She talked about it. It's a process. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to learn. Um, we learn stuff from people every single day. We learn stuff from you. Um, we're learning to get, you know, to make our program better. But this is this is the start. And uh, again, I applaud you for coming. The team that we've assembled back here, we'll introduce the team uh, in a little bit. The team we assembled back here, they've been there, done that. All right, and a lot of them started just like you. A little bit about me. Um, yes, I'm the director of Army Aviation. Um, we look at things uh, like the rest of the Iowa Army National Guard as leaders. We're certain leaders. Uh, we started in your shoes. I was enlisted. I started enlisted and went through OCS. A little bit of background on me just to, to kind of lessen the, the anxiety in the room and the crowd a little bit, you know? So um, I started enlisted. I was an E1 through E4. Went to OCS. I was a mechanic on a Blackhawk. In fact, um, you guys, my mentor as far as the pilot, sitting right back there, Mr. Dave Thorin. I used to, I used to be a crew chief with Dave Thorin when he was flying uh, as a young W1. And I learned as an instructor pilot from Mr. Thorin how to fly the aircraft or, you know, to get better at flying the aircraft. Um, it doesn't matter. What I'm telling you is, you go through life. Right, you have mentors through your program. We want to become a mentor. Our job here, the people that are back here that, that have gone there, done, or been there, done that, they're here to mentor you. All right, and I will tell you a life lesson is you need to have mentorships or mentors in your life. We're about building humans and about building leaders. Every single person in that cockpit, you want to be in that cockpit and fly that aircraft. I want you to take that away. We're looking for leaders. You're going to make decisions in that aircraft. That will make life or death decisions for people that you are carrying on board that aircraft. And the flight, you might be a flight lead flying multi-ship with multiple aircraft. You might be making decisions for that entire organization, that entire flight. All right, so we're looking for leaders and that's what we're here to do today. Does that make sense? All right, so first thing I'm gonna have you guys do is just, you probably, some of you came together, right? Some of you know each other, but you might be sitting at the table and you don't know each other. First thing I want you to do is just take a second Turn around and introduce yourself to the, the surrounding people, shake hands, get to know the person next to you. So do that right now. That's a <laughs>
a cell phone, uh, please turn it off and turn it to vibrate. If you need to take a call or you need to use the restroom, get up and go. All right, take the call, step outside, go to the back of the room. I, we're not offended by that. We have lights, everybody's got business to do. Um, it's Saturday morning and there's things you guys are taking away from your personal life. I, I, I understand that. All right, so from the get-go, the organization that you're, that you're asking to be a part of is excited to have you here and we're excited to see you. But we are going to, ex we're going to explain this is a process. This is a challenging process. It's competitive. Right? We're looking for the best people to become part of this program, as is everybody, right? as is everybody in the Iowa organization and in the Army itself. Again, I focus on character and leaders. That's what we're looking for in leaders. My job up here is to welcome you and to kind of explain Iowa aviation. We're a subset of the Army. So just like if you guys are coming from different organizations and units, MTO structure-wise, the Army has an MTO structure. We have portions of that MTO structure within Iowa. We break those down across the state. All right, we have flight facilities in the state. You've heard one of the questions, one of the things you need to think about. But what aircraft do you want to fly? You know, what part of the state do you live in? Where is your mentorship going to be? Hopefully this brings you a little bit of information about what different organizations we have, where they're located at. And again, we do that for a few different reasons. We spread that out for recruiting basis, but we all spread it out because we have facilities that, that house those aircraft, do the maintenance on those aircraft uh, Monday through Friday. A lot of those people sit in the back of the room that have those full-time positions. All right, so here's the mission for uh, the SAO, myself, the, the Director of Aviation, State Aviation Officers, what that stands for, and the ASIP. The ASIP is an Army Aviation Support Facility, right? That's a full-time organization that's here to support the units. We train the units uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the 67 Troop Command within the state of Iowa, the 248 ASB, the Aviation Support Battalion then, and then all the separate flight companies that are underneath that organizational structure. So our job, they're our customer. So as an ASIP or as a SAO, those units are my customer and our job is to help maintain that structure. So whether it's maintenance, as one part of the mission, and, and then the other part of the mission is training aviators and their crew members, non crew members, okay? Uh, we're committed to operational success, continuous improvement, safety, big portion of what we do, uh, community and personal development. That all relates to the, the opening comments that I made. We have a number of different airframes in the in the uh, in the state of Iowa. 26 for a medium-sized state for, for Army aviation. When you look at other states, we, you know, you look at across the United States, California would be a large state, or Texas would be a large state, for example. They have in the 30s or 40s of numbers of aircraft. We have 26. Um, we have a bat simulator, the first bat simulator um, in the nation to go to the guard. We have that. It's a great asset to our organization. We have shadows, which you saw in that picture earlier. Those right now are deployed to the, to the southwest border. Um, so we have four shadows. And then we have one king here, uh, which is a twin engine airplane. Okay, then we talked about our flight facilities here. Boone, Waterloo, Davenport, and then Joint Base Des Moines is, is a future endeavor that we're working on, constantly working on to move um, towards uh, that, that base. Next slide. Any questions so far? Good. All right, so the Aviation Support Battalion, again, we're here to support that support battalion. My, my job as the Director of Aviation is to support this force structure in Iowa. We have flight company-wise, where those aircraft exist, Charlie Company 147, UH-60 Mike models. Let me tell you something about the Iowa National Guard as a representation of, of really our service and our readiness. We have all new aircraft in the state of Iowa, and I can give kind of those aircraft, we keep saying that, but we have guys that you know, in the back that flew Hueys that were in Vietnam, right? And those aircraft are 20, 30 years old. We picked aircraft up. This is one example. Charlie Company 147 picked aircraft up from the factory, brand new. Those aircraft are in boom. Um, we were flying aircraft fighter that had 5,000 and 8,000 hours on them. They had nine hours on them when we picked them up. Pretty amazing. All right? One of the few states, uh, organizations that had that experience. Um, SNS. We have the uh, Security Support Battalion Lakotas, brand new aircraft. We got to pick those things up, and we got those transferred us brand new. Um, Charlie Company 147, or 211, rather, the Medevac in Waterloo. Waterloo has our oldest airframes, although they aren't scheduled to get new refurbished airframes in 2025. Uh, that's a UH-60 Blackhawk, the Alpha Lima, and they'll be getting the Victor model Blackhawks, which is a glass cockpit Blackhawk. Um, and then we have the Davenport ASIP, which is CH-47s, brand new aircraft, brand new F-model aircraft, all right? And then 
Finally, down with the black, which is harder to read at the bottom, we have the King Air, the Osatom airplane that's out of the Joint Base Des Moines. So that kind of gives you a location where those are black oxen in Boo, black oxen LUH in, in Waterloo, and Chinooks and LUH in, in Davenport. Make sense? So as you're looking at that, how you apply that to yourself is, hey, home of record. Again, we're talking about mentorship. We're here to start to get the mentorship program started. If you are uh, living in the, uh, I don't know, Iowa City area, you know, Waterloo or Davenport is going to be the location that will probably be best because they're a mentorship program. You're going to need to get to that ASA and work with those mentors. Does that make sense? Maybe you, maybe you go to Iowa State and you live in a different part of the state, but you, you, you know, you're a student in Iowa State. Maybe that, maybe Boom would be better for you. So that's what you need to think about. Okay. All right, next slide. So just to talk a little bit about Boom, 147 helicopter battalion. Um, they're based out of uh, Boone, obviously, but their battalion and their uh, the division or brigade is up in Minnesota, and they have a close relationship with that. The other thing we have there is the ASB, the support battalion. Again, that's the battalion headquarters, and again, all four structure aviation falls underneath that battalion headquarters in Iowa. And then we have the UAS shadow platoon, which belongs to BED, that all flies out of there. Uh, we provide air assault operations, air movement operations, supplies, equipment, maneuver. That's the primary mission of this company here, the primary aviation organization within that, um, within that facility. 10 UH-60s, four, four shadows. We can look at their deployments. And I'll just get this out here now for an organization. Aviation is on a short window dwell time. All right, so we kind of extended that dwell time. We were on a three, 3.4 year dwell time to, to one year mode. That's, that's kind of spread out a little bit more. We're closer to the four year. We're trying to get to the five year mode. So you're asking to join an organization, you're asking to join um, an operational organization, and that means there's a lot that goes on with aviation. That's what the mentor's here to talk to you about. There's a lot of things that go on in aviation. It's not one weekend a month, and I know a lot of jobs aren't one weekend a month. The aviation truly is an operational organization, and our deployment cycles are much faster than most. Okay, which should excite you in a lot of ways, and a lot of you, a lot of you want to have that experience, right? They're great experiences, but they come often and fast, right, in aviation. So you can look at their deployments. In fact, they just got back. Charlie Company just got back seven, eight months ago from OIR, Operation Inherent Resolve, and OSS down in, in Kuwait, Iraq. Okay. All right, next slide. Waterloo, uh, SNS Battalion, or SNS Company, and the uh, Medevac Company. Two great organizations uh, housed out of that. ASIP, they provide security support civilian agencies through NORTCOM, so that's the SNS specifically. Just to give you a different look, they actually work as a stateside uh, as command as NORTCOM. Um, and Southwest Border, for example, is a mobilization for them. Uh, there's a unit down there, not our unit, but uh, Shadow is a part of that organization as it, as it works at the border. The SNS would be an example they go do that. They, they do a lot of things to support, uh, like when the president comes to town, or the vice president or dignitaries come to town, they work with Secret Service, they work with law enforcement. Their equipment on the aircraft has that capability um, that they're looking for. And then of course you guys understand the medevac mission within the UH-60 community. Uh, air medevac is something that really Army Aviation bases our support around. A lot of times, ground force commanders, you know, that one hour medical ring, one hour for uh, somebody to be at, uh, at a hospital, uh, the medevac really determines that. So it's stationed in the medevac, critical asset on the, on the battlefield. Uh, so we have airframes up there, six U860 Alpha Limas, which is a half of a company, all right? So the other half is up in Minnesota. I told you we have portions of aviation force structure. Aviation force structure is something that is, uh, um, sought after and it's desirable to have in every state. So aviation has to divide some of that up. We're talking about millions of dollars worth of aircraft and we're talking about response capabilities for domestic operations. Um, I haven't mentioned that yet, but domestic operations is something that the governor, the TAG, uh, through the governor, you know, has a resource to use in just about all domestic operations that we have. COVID being the side, we didn't do much in COVID, right? There's a lot being done from COVID that's just not necessarily on the aviation side. We did do some. But as an example, domestic operations, these aircraft are used for those type of operations. So we divide those up. Minnesota has part of the medevac. You can see the need for a medevac in, in uh, the state of Minnesota, for example. There's a need for it in Iowa. So we divide them up. LUH is the same thing. So we have 
two aircraft in Davenport, two aircraft in Waterloo. And then that's a deck that belongs to a, another company, basically, which is in Nebraska. So they have aircraft in Nebraska. So that's how it works in aviation. We divide it out because we're expensive, all right? Seven, the old numbers, I don't know if these are accurate, but it's close. Uh, somewhere around 7% of the Army and 20, 25% of the budget, something like that, all right? We're expensive, all right? So in, in Iowa specifically, you can look at the deployments, the evaluation with the Germany, 30-day rotation. There's a good chance that they'll be going to the southwest border um, yet this year. Medevac. They've been to OIR, OEF, OEF again, all right, and they're cons constantly on that rotational cycle. So you can see that they haven't deployed since 17, so you can guess what's coming in the future or likely to come in the future, whether that's uh, any number of spots, whether it's OEF or OIR or Kosovo, all right? Next slide. Davenport, uh, again, part of the SNS, we talked about it, and then the Chinooks, uh, CH 47. C-47F to be specific, that's the, the newest airframe, those things are monsters, they can lift a ton, all right? And they're the primary resource when we're looking at Afghanistan and air troop movements and things of that nature. Um, heavy lift, all right, for cargo. Uh, deployments, they're deployed right now. So they're OAR, 03, OAR 2010, OEF in 2016, and they're deployed right now uh, to OAR in, in Iraq, all right? Kind of give you an idea of what's going on with aviation, get it? You understand where those locations are at within within Iowa. Okay, next slide. All right, so these numbers, Iowa is traditionally and, and always has been really good at recruiting. And part of it is because we work so well with the RV and because there's a draw towards aviation. We don't take that for granted. You're here, we're here to get to know you, we're here because of you. All right, but we are always looking to fill. I carry a piece of paper around with me, I have in my hand right now, flight schools. I carry it with me everywhere I go. On average, I get about nine school seats a year. We, as an Army Aviation Program, get nine school seats a year. We divide those between officers and warrants. It's the same process for officers, it's the same process. Your commissioning source is different, but, oh, but flight school and your, and your career is the same, officer or warrant officer in the Guard. There's some misnomers out there, hey, as an, as a, as an officer, I'm not gonna get to fly as much as a warrant officer. Um, there's some truth to that, especially in the active component. In the Guard, whether you're a warrant officer or an officer, it, it really depends on you and how much you're willing to get into the facility and fly, how much you're willing to take away from whatever your civilian operation or civilian job is to get in and fly. I can tell you, I'm a, I'm a uh, not current test pilot, I'm an instructor pilot. If you look in the active component, that's not, it's hard to find. All right, it's hard to find. I'm still flying as a colonel. It's really hard to find, all right? I've got lieutenant colonels, facility commanders. There's a lot of opportunity in the guard for, for a, an officer to fly as well as a warrant officer. So take that misnomer and just throw it away. I can just tell you that right now from experience, right, in the program. These are a list of what our, what our total numbers are and what we're looking for. We want to be 125% strength. I got the officer, the warrant officer, CCWO for the state of Iowa sitting in the back. And our goal is to be at 125% strength for warrant officers. We're close, but through turnover and through, you know, people leaving uh, the organization for retirements or transferring because of jobs and things of that nature, there's also constant turnover. So we know what that is, and we look to fill that piece back up every time. So just to kind of give you, give you an idea, we're always wanting to get to that 125% strength. All right? Because of those mobilizations, because, you know, life, life happens. So I put that up there just to show you that uh, as an organization, we've got quite a few aviators. There's always a need to keep filling it, so you're in the right place. Next slide. All right, so our next flight school board, you can write this stuff down. This is stuff that your mentors will get with you. I'm not by any means saying that you will be ready for a September 24th flight school board. But maybe the March one, there may be somebody in here that will be ready for the March one. All right. I can tell you that there are, I have, out of those nine school seats, I try to work ahead. So this board, everybody in this room, I'm looking for who's going to go to flight school in the end of 22 to 23. That's where I'm really looking. I could get, and I do have a school seat, maybe one or two school seats yet this year. Someone could get to in this room. I put the carrot out there, but the expectation here is, is that you've got to be in the right place uh, in your life. You've got to be in the right place within your career. And you got to understand that what we're going to be looking for is really about you. We're looking for how do you manage your civilian career and your officer career. 
specifically in this case, the aviation career. Um, it's not one or the other. You have to be able to manage both. And that's one of the challenges that we're here to help mentor you through because we've all done it. All right? There's a lot of misnomers out there that uh, I can guard bum and I can stay in that, you know, I can fly and just be a part of the aviation structure. That's not going to work, all right, in your civilian life. You've got to have, you got to be able to manage both of those things. We're here to teach you that. We're here to understand about um, your situation in life and, and how that's going to work and help program that in for you. If you truly want to do this, it's going to take a life, a life work balance, right? And these people are here to talk to you about that. All right. Questions for me? Really, just getting the, getting this started. You're going to get a whole bunch of information on, you know, what are the what's the requirements? Uh, you know, what's the age cutoff? What is, uh, you know, all those little things. So we're going to go through that stuff. She's going to walk through what it takes to be an Army aviator. We're going to operationalize it for you. We're going to sit down as mentors and walk through it with you a little bit more in detail to you specifically. So if you're stick around past that and you can uh, pass the lunch break and you want to do that, we're here for that. Okay? Questions? I see one. Yes, sir. Uh, I heard rumors that they're trying to move all the aviation to Des Moines. Is that true? That's not true. No, I will. that is not true. So Des Moines Air Base has uh, possibly, or Boone would be the one that would move, so the UH-60s would move to Des Moines Air Base. Um, that is something that is, is going to happen in time. It takes a lot to get an air base ready. All right, so I, I think uh, we've talked about with the facility commander back there. We've been working it since 2010, or was it for somewhere in there? All right, it's 21. All right, so it takes time, right, to move that stuff. It's a big, it's a big move, it's a big lift. All right, so, but Davenport and Waterloo, no. They're still there. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. All right, so let me just introduce the guys in the back and the guys and gals in the back of the room real quick that are here to help you. You guys would just stand up and just introduce yourselves one at a time if you would. Start with uh, the youngest aviator back in high school with that nice haircut. Uh, hello, I'm Mr. Hill, so I fly for Charlie Company, the Assault Auto. I got back to high school in October. Last year, and I'm a full-time unit training officer. I'm Mr. Perrine. I work full-time with the aviation facility. I'm a state standardization officer. My 39th year flying. So, you know, it's like you know, yeah. Morning, G. Lucci. I work on Waterloo full-time. Uh, I get to uh, drill out of the bins so I get the best of both drills. <laughs> Mr. Campbell, uh, I fly out of Boone. I'll tell you, Colonel Nick White, I'm the uh, ace of the commander at noon, and I'm also a vet's rear, I'm the six of the commander. I'm an admin operations officer for the 248 ASP, and I work full time with Colonel Lampy in the SA office, and I apply to the police. I'm a CW Regional Health. I uh, fly out of Boone, and then I'm also the IO for the for the bad civilian set. Instructor operator. Instructor operator, sorry. I'm Major Brian Geats. I work at the Davenport Flight Facility. Logistics officer there, or deputy commander there at the facility. I started in Charlie Company in Boone, flying the Black Ops, made my way to the SNS as the commander there, flying the Codas, and then uh, now at the Davenport facility, flying Chinooks. So definitely a different path, but it's one that can be done, and uh, certainly enjoyed it. I am uh, CB5 Jeff Lee, the command chief warrant officer, the seventh uh, for the Iowa National Guard. I do not fly. I do have wings. Uh, actually, uh, I earned my wings through flight operations. It's somebody who's going to support you as you go up in the air. And I went through my through my first MOS with now CW5 Dave Perrine. So he's he's touched uh, many lives and continues to do that. And, uh, and uh, you know, we'll we'll talk here in a little bit. All right. So I'll finish up with saying uh, it's a small small world in aviation. All right. So. Um, I know people that I went to flight school with that are, uh, you know, maybe directors in another state, for example. It's a small world. Um, I've been doing this for 28 years now. I've been in aviation for uh, just over 20. Uh, been in the guard. So again, I'm going to come back to where I started. Everybody back there went through this process. It can be done. It's on you to do this process. They all went through this process, and it's an individual process. 
right? It's on you. And I encourage you, if you want, you saw that video, all those neat things that we get to do. It truly is that neat. It's that exciting. I mean, I watched that video, and not a, every one of those guys back there were watching that video. When, that, when a helicopter flies over, I can tell you, every one of those guys stopped what they're doing. They're mowing the yard. They stop what they're doing, and they're looking. Because it's exciting, all right? But I will tell you, it's work. I'm not here to be a, to De a Debbie Downer. It's work. There's a lot of things that go into this, all right? Um, but it's challenging. And I, I know you're all here because you're wanting a challenge. It's a challenge. You're learning every single day. You're learning every time you're in that cockpit. It's exciting. It's fun. You get to go do neat things. Um, and everybody stops what they're doing when we show up, which is pretty darn neat. But there's a lot of responsibility with it, all right? A lot of responsibility with it. One of those aircraft, to, you know, the Mike model is somewhere in the $18 million range, right? $18 million. And anything that happens in that aircraft is national news instantly. So we're looking for professionals. You're all part of the profession. We're looking for people to stand out and, and become professional aviators. We're looking for good humans. Does that make sense? So welcome to the program. I'm excited to have you here. I'll turn it back over to uh, Mr. Mr. All right, now I'd like to welcome Command Chief Warrant Officer Jeff Lee. He's uh, Command Chief for State Auto. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm happy, I'm privileged to be here on this, this August Saturday morning, right? And I'm happy that you're here because I, too, applied for flight school, okay? Way back when, way back when. Um, and I was actually had a, a w, WOCSC I also had another opportunity to cook it. But I had a wife and two kids, and um, I, I, I elected to do that other opportunity, which was an AGR assignment for Title 10, going off doing guard bureau stuff and all those other, other things, using that flight operations. So bottom line, this organization will give you that opportunity. It's a matter of if you will step forward. Right? Just like Colonel Lampy said, it is work. It is work. It shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, we're, we're paying a lot of money to get you trained up. Um, but, but, but at the same time, you get to fly for free. And in fact, we're going to pay you to fly the Army aircraft. That's awesome, right? OK, so warrant officers. I know some of you are thinking about the mission officer route. Some of you are thinking the warrant officer route. Across the state of Iowa, warrant officers manage warrant officers. CW5 Dave, Dave Thorin, once again, the name that's been mentioned this morning sits on part of that sits on that board. Okay, warrant officers, manage warrant officers. There's five, there's four CW5 positions that are aviation centered. CW5 Dave Green, CW5 Corey Crane, CW5 Greg Wilbur, and CW5 Jeremy Walter, soon to be CW5 Jeremy Walter. Alright? You can progress. The odds are in your favor, believe it or not, of the of the seven, 67 slots that are rated aviators, odds are in your favor that you could have one of those opportunities. So the career is there. The lifelong career is there. It's a matter of you deciding if this is really what you want to do. Now, as you think about that, I can tell you I have this nice scar, OK? Some of you up front can see it. Some of you back can't. I actually was diagnosed with thyroid cancer uh, back in 2005, as a matter of fact. And so they, they, uh, they, they cut my neck open, split me up, did some other things. Now I don't have a thyroid. Okay, so that, that's, that's, a, that, that's a physical ailment that I have that could, could in fact, if I was on flight status, would jeopardize, could, could jeopardize my flight, my ability to fly. Okay? So, so what, what am I really saying here? I'm saying you are healthier today than you will be a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. So if you're really considering this, dig deep, listen to what Ms. Spiker has to say, because it's only, you're only going to get worse, right? Okay. Trust me. I've been there. I'm there now. I'm 50, going to be 53. Um, lumps and bumps. You know, when, when we get together, we talk about lumps and bumps. Um, Iowa Warrant Officers, here's what we're really looking for. And Ms. Spiker is, is, is totally dialed into this as well. We are looking for technical soldiers, or expert soldiers, expert technicians, and expert leaders. Colonel Lampy already, already hit on the leadership side. We need you to be a leader in that cockpit. 
We need you to be a leader in your organization within your career field. Well, let me talk about being a technical soldier. Warrant officers in the Iowa Guard, I look at them and assume, right, one of the requirements is that you meet height weight, you meet PT standards, you're already doing your, your PHAs, you're already doing your weapons squad, you're being a soldier. That, that is like the baseline, right? So, that, so, so if you have challenges in those areas, again, you, you gotta look, look, look at yourself in the mirror, okay, because you own that piece. An expert technician means that not only do you go to school on time, you continue through progression, you become a PIC and within your aircraft, you get tracked and different things like that, but you're also doing the self study because it is work. In all reality, it is work, but again, it's work. And of course, the expert leaders, those, those folks who actually, who, who continue to progress. So that's what I leave you with this morning. I leave you with that challenge. These folks are here today to answer your questions. Ask them, get their email contact, reach out to them afterwards, because there's always, there's always more questions. But again, thank you for coming. Administrative data, pretty 
self-explanatory. Please fill out the top completely. Uh, what I want you to, you don't have to fill it out right now, but there is a spot on there for flight facility preference. So if you want to hear a little bit more about the briefing before you decide, if you already know, I want to go to Boone, or I want to go to Waterloo, or wherever, go ahead and circle which one uh, you prefer. Question? Yeah. Where do you want us to put for fire service? For the fire service? Yes, it's fire service. What do you mean? Yes. Yes, it's fire service. Oh, sorry. So M day just means you're a drilling member, if you don't know that. You're just a traditional drilling soldier. If you have questions, yeah, don't be afraid to ask. Like, this is the time to ask those questions to make sure this is filled out correctly. Okay. All right, question one. What is your age and birthday? Your birthday matters because if you're getting close to that 33, uh, your birthday, where it lands, if you fly more, it's going to make a huge difference. So please put your age and your actual birthday with the year. If you are older than 33 or will be older than 33 by the September 2021 flight board, please put age waiver under the waiver block. I'm gonna kind of fly through this, so if anyone needs me to slow down, please let me know, okay? What is your GT score? It's gonna be on your ERB located under section one under the assignment information, you have to have a 110 or higher on your GT. A lot of people retake the ASFAB to get that 110. It's not impossible. It's not a huge hurdle if you take the time to study and increase that score. But that is not waiverable. You have to have a 110 GT score. If you don't have a 110 under the missing requirements block, please put GT score. You don't have your ERB and you know what it is, put it in there. All right, question three. Are you a U.S. citizen by birth or naturalization? This is not a, a determination on whether you get selected. Uh, we just need to know that information because there's an extra process in the naturalization process that we have to put in your packet. So it's good to know up front uh, that that has to be done instead of all of a sudden at the, at the back end, we're like, oh, yeah, we didn't know this and we're trying to trying to fix it. So just put birth or naturalization. Question four, do you have a PT profile? So waivers aren't granted. You, you can't be on a permanent profile going to flight school. It's just it's, the opportunity is not there. Um, if you're on a temp profile, or even if you're on a permanent profile and you get that cleared, um, you have to be able to take the standard DCFT, whatever that becomes a record event. Um, on top of that, it could possibly hold up your flight physical. So it's a, it's a very thorough physical, and whatever you are on the profile for could potentially need a waiver, could potentially be a disqualifier. Uh, may hold up your flight physical and cannot fed rec. You absolutely cannot move forward in the process uh, or attend the flight board until you have an approved flight physical. If you have a, a profile, please add that to missing requirements. All right, question five. If you have any history of failing the PT test or height and weight? Okay, so we're kind of in a unique situation right now, right? Because When's the last time everyone took an actual PT test? 2019? It's been a while. Right. So uh, if you have history prior to that, I'm not saying it's a complete showstopper, but I will tell you that PT and height and weight are looked at very, very closely. Not just on the flight board, but also the federal recognition board. If you are an individual who passes a PT test, barely passes and then fails and then passes and then fails. You're what we call a yo-yo, 
right? We're not going to send you to flight school when you're barely passing a PT test because you are going to be so busy during that school that it's guaranteed your PT scores are probably going to go down if you're not focusing on it. So sending somebody who's barely passing or has a history of not uh, being reliable, it's going to affect your flight board packet. So if you could put just a brief, um, I guess, summary of, of prior to, or if you've got some diagnostic that is not in your packet, I know some of you have probably taken the ACFT as a diagnostic. Go ahead and you can put that information in there. You just need to give that, that mentor that you're going to interview with an idea of who you are on the PT side. Are you a habitual failure? Have you never failed? What's your average score? When we were taking the APFT, what was your average score? Or what was your 2019 score? Any questions on that? I know it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird situation. Yeah. So that definitely every time you can, you know, year goes by and we show, okay, hey, this is, you know, yeah. every, every three months I've been doing this, but we show that pattern. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. The flight board is in your hands. Like, it's, you know, a PT test right now is not required, right? If you want to get on that flight board and you go take, six diagnostic, just so you can walk in front of the board and say, hey, look, it's not required, but I took it six times, and this is what I got on it, I can do it. Absolutely, that shows initiative, right? It shows that you're dedicated and that you're you're taking it very seriously. All right, question six, do you have a security clearance? You have to have a final secret security clearance before you go to the flight board. It only has to be a secret, it does not have to be top secret. If you've got one, please put yes on the date it was completed. Interim security clearances do not suffice. It has to be a final adjudicated one. Secret security clearances are good for 10 years, so if your completed date is 10 years ago, which you all look pretty young. I don't know if any of you have been in 10 years, but um, if it's outside of that, then uh, if you don't have one, please list that in the missing requirements. They don't have those secrets to All right, question seven. Do you have any adverse legal actions? This is anything other than minor traffic violations. Okay, anything other than minor traffic. Um, this is a big one because this talks about your moral and values, this is about your character, right? So waivers are granted on a case-by-case -case basis, but I tell you, there's a lot that go into waivers. Uh, if you have multiple alcohol <laughs> violations on your record, there's a pretty good chance you're probably not going to go to the flight board. Now, if they were 10 years ago, you got one MIT as a, as a teenager or whatever, I'm not saying that's a showstopper, but if you're showing habitual violations with alcohol or drugs, that not only on the, on the moral side is going to hold you up, it's also going to hold you up on the flight. You have to say if you've ever been arrested. So even if you have been charged, if you have been arrested, you still have to disclose that on your flight. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, you brought up that there's age waivers and moral waivers. Is there like a limit on how many waivers you're allowed to have for the flight back or is it more than a There's no limit on the amount of waivers. It's about whether the senior leaders that are sitting in the back room support that. They got to look at the big picture and say, yeah, we, we want this guy. We're willing to, to support a moral waiver and an age waiver and whatever else it takes. So time, time is another thing. If you got an OWI last weekend, sorry, <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, now, again, time and space. It's been a long time, and you went, got your degree, and you have a family now, and a full-time career, and you fixed yourself. All of those things are taken into consideration. 
consideration, but, but that is a big one. If you have any law violations other than minor traffic, please put moral waiver under required waivers. Do you have any tattoos requiring the waiver? So th this is really just more of an administrative, unless you have something super offensive, not a big deal, but if you've got anything below your wrist, below your knee, or on your neck, we need, we need to know. What is your pull piece? So this is also on your ERB. Uh, picket fence, what we call it, all ones, right? That's what we typically want to see. Uh, if you have a two or a three in there, um, it could be something as simple as you haven't been to the dentist in a while, uh, or it could be something much more serious that, that needs to be addressed. But if you know what it is, please mark it on there. Again, this is just an indicator that there could be an issue with, with your flight physical. If there's something, I might hold it up. All right, question 10 and 11. Do you have any eyesight issues? Do you wear glasses? Are you colorblind? Have you ever had a LASIK or ERK? I have a question for number nine. If we don't have the full score, uh, what should we put? Just leave a blank. Okay. Are you my Air Force fan? I am. Do, do they have a full piece in the? They do. I just know that I'm almost positive. I know what it is. But okay. Have it, but sure. That's okay. No worries. So LASIK and PRK, there's always a lot of questions on eyesight. And bottom line would be very upfront. You can ask me all day long about, hey, my vision is 20, blah, 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 and I'm going to tell you, I don't know. Because there is a standard, right? But I cannot, as a strength manager, I am not a physician, I'm not a doctor, I, I do not approve those. You have to go to your flight physical to figure out if you're within a standard and if it's waiverable. I have seen waivers for an uh, individual who was very, very close, barely failed. They provided, they gave a waiver. But if you have eyesight issues, um, I cannot today stand here and say, oh yeah, you're good, or you're not good. Um, and LASIK and PRK, it's really not a big deal. There's a lot of aviators that, that have done it. It's just there's a uh, waiver process to it. There's a 90-day wait period when you get it, and you have to have the before and the after results, but not a big deal. It's not a showstopper. All right, question 12, have you taken the SIFT? If you have not taken the SIFT, it's OK. Uh, it just needs to be completed before the flight board, and honestly, should really be completed before you even start the mentorship program. And so the mentorship program, you're assigned a senior aviator who kind of takes you under their wing, and, and uh, they are your contact through the flight board process. You typically don't like to assign those until we know you have a passing SIF, because what happens is you spend all this time mentoring, and then you can't pass the test, and then it looks for nothing. So if you haven't taken it, not a big deal, but it's definitely one of those things that you want to do sooner rather than later. You can go right here at the education office. If you live more on the eastern side of the state, you can go to Rock Island. 4187 that you have to fill out, you have your commander sign it, you turn it into the education office, and they'll call you and, uh, and schedule a, a test date. We do have some study manuals in the back that the education office provided. You're welcome to take those. If you need one, there's I think five or six back there. So uh, I guess never get to it first. Otherwise, the education office is ordering more if uh, you need one. Also on Amazon for like 20 bucks if you want to get one yourself. But um, those resources are available back there. <coughs> If you have taken a SIF, though, please mark yes on there. Uh, so, does it say you on the ERP where uh, SIF score? Nope, it won't be on your ERP. 
for the, for the sip, you get two shots. Oh yeah, yep. That's it, right? So don't go wrong and take it without prep, all right? You yeah. only get two shots at it. All right, do you have any NCR yards with a negative rating? If you don't, if you're not an NCO, just please put NA in that block. Obviously, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter to you, but NCO is in the room. Uh, all of your NCR yards are looked at on the blackboard, every single one of them. So if you have something on an NCR yard that needs improvement or does not meet standard, I would address it today. Go ahead and mark it on there and address it with whoever you're interviewing with. Um, it was a long time ago. Obviously, that's not as big of a deal as if you had a referred into a ER, uh, that closed out last month. And what, what was the reason? Was it PT? Was it Sharp? Was it EO? What, what was it? Leadership? We need to look at those things. So if you have any needs improvement, please mark those under the uh, block three and three ERs. Question 14, where your command endorse your flight packet. We put this on here because there's been individuals in the past who have started building a flight packet and then all of a sudden get to the letters of recommendation and their company or battalion commander says, no way, not, I don't support it. And that's where your packet ends because you have to have that letter of recommendation from your company and battalion commander. They have to support it. So if this is something you are serious about, you need to have that conversation with your command. Hey, I'm looking at going to flight school. Do you see any issues? Because I'm going to need a letter of recommendation from you. And they should be forthcoming on whether they support that or not. Also, don't ask them the week before your flight packet is due. Because you're not going to get it. These things take some time. They should have a lot of thought put into it. They should be well written, um, not generic. And if you're asking them a week before the flight packet is due, one, that doesn't give them much time. And two, if they do give you one, it's probably not going to be super thought out. And so you need to you need to start that early. Those letters are good for 12 months. So, sorry. Can I just add something to that? Yep. This is why you want to be an aviator, right? You're talking about we're going to my the letter and the the record, the letters of recommendation. Have you talked about the why you want to be an aviator? Not yet, sir. Okay. Well, I want to add something to that. Okay. I apologize. Let me interrupt. Question 15. Do you have any college credit degree? Um, just mark on there whether you've got a college degree, what level it is. This is not, like I said, from the warrant officer side, not required. Um, does it hurt your packet? No. It, it helps your packet. You know, you've shown that you can get a higher education than what your grades are, they, they look at all of that. Uh, if you want to be an officer, you've got to have that for your degree. So please mark that information. Yeah, on the officer side, nine, we'll get to that. He's 90 credits to start OCS with a four year degree. There. So uh, on the flight board, again, you have the checklist in your packet. You can see everything that goes into it, but if you get a, a D in a class, they're probably going to ask you about it. They're going to ask you why, why you suck at that. And you're going to ask me, even if it was 10 years ago. They look at every, everything, whole package. All right, question 16. Have you attended any courses that would support your application? There's probably some individuals in this room who have a private pilot license, or taking some courses, an instructor, whatever. I want to know or your mentor, your interviewee, wants to know, do you have any civilian experience that you bring to the table? For aviation. I don't need to know if you're a chef or whatever else. Aviation specific. Same thing with question 17. If you have any civilian employment experience, that supports your application. Again, aviation specific. If you do, Go ahead and let us know how many years of experience you have. Question 18, do you have any other concerns? This is really just a block for you to fill out as the day goes on. As you get more information, if there's something that pops up, I want you to write it down so that it can be addressed during the interview or you can pull 
pull me aside during the break and ask me if you have a question. All right, this is a new one for this year. If you flip over to the next page, it's briefly explain what your five and 10 year plan is in the National Park. So we want to know what your short term and long term goals are in the guard. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to fill that out. You don't have to go, I mean, you don't have to write a book, right? But I want you to summarize it, make it, make it clear so that when you go in for that interview, uh, you can talk about those bullet points that you put on there. So go ahead and do that now.
So here's the overview. If you're looking at the board officer side, uh, how it works is first you go to the flight board, which the board determines whether they want you as an aviator. If they say yes, we want we want you as an aviator, then you attend the FedRec board, which has a 06 on the board. They can go to yeah. So the board. And numerous, uh, yes, and numerous board officers who determine whether they want you as an officer. So it's really kind of a two-step process. I have, I personally have not seen anybody uh, get recommended by the flight board and not recommended by the federal board. It's a, it's a pretty stringent process, right? So by the time you get there, uh, you should be well prepared for that board. As long as the FedRec board recommends you, uh, then you attend WOCS, you commission as a WO1, and then you go to flight school. If you're going to go the officer route, you do, it's, it's flip-flopped. You do your commissioning source first, and then you get selected by the flight board, and then you go to flight school. So, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you want to be an aviator as an officer, that you don't get selected, you're still becoming an officer just in a different branch because you didn't get selected for aviation. So where do you start? Really, your first step should be contacting the flight facility um, or me. But today, we're bringing all those resources to you. So this is where you start. You start with an interview. And uh, and that's where you're screened, right? Just like you just did in this last brief. You're screened to see if there are any potential issues that would stop you from becoming an aviator. Once we identify that there's really, you know, nothing that would stop you, you know, dead in your tracks, then we move you on to the mentorship process. And depending on, again, where that is, we've got Port of Waterloo, uh, depends on who your mentor is. So the difference between aviators and the rest of, at least the war officer world, is that aviators are selected at the state level by Colonel Lamb. Uh, any other war officer on the technical side is selected by a regimental chief, which is uh, a national. It's the guy who selects active duty reserve and guard. But we are lucky enough to do this at the state level. All right, so board officer application process. You gotta take the SIFT. Like I said, you have to score above a 40. You should take the SIFT before you, before you do your physical. There are individuals who squeak through and get one scheduled uh, without us knowing, but the right process is to take that SIFT first and then take your flight physical. And that's because if you can't pass the SIFT, again, we're wasting resources at AMED, like a med deck. Um, there's only so many spots that they can handle each month, so we ask that you take that SIFT first. Uh, the SIFT results are included in your flight packet, scheduled to the education office. Uh, you can only take the SIFT twice, and your first passing score is also your permanent score. So if you score a 40, that's your score. You don't get to go retake and try to get anything higher than that. Then you do your flight physical, which you schedule through your mentor. It's conducted at the med dev, but approved by Fort Rucker. Uh, these flight physicals can take 90 days. So backwards planning, if packets are due beginning of September, you know, you need to backwards plan 90 days and schedule that physical. If you need a waiver, you're gonna need to add some time on top of that as well. A copy of your flight physical is included in your packet and they're also good for 18 months. So if you're close to that 18 months, uh, you're already pushing it, you're going to need it when you go to flight school, so you have to do a second one. Um, but just know that it has to be within that 18 months when you go to the flight board. Waivers, most waivers are included in your flight packet. The only exception is an age waiver. So age waivers are done at the end of the process. You go to the flight board, you get recommended, and then we submit an age waiver. Uh, 
uh, moral waivers, medical waivers, tattoo waivers, all of those are included in your flight packet. So those have to be done. Again, time management, those have to be done before you submit your packet. All of those have a different process. So moral waivers, through me. Uh, a medical waiver is through Fort Rucker and, and the med dead, Sergeant uh, Bottom Rock, POC for those. Tattoo, that's through me, and age is through me as well. But that's what I'm here for. It's when you're building these and you're like, gosh, so much information, I don't know where to get this from. That's when you call me and I say, this is for this is the person, or I do this, or whatever. I'm there to answer your questions. So once you have your SIF passed, your flight packet passed, your waiver is approved, and your flight packet built, then you go to the flight board, which are typically conducted every September and February, which you guys have the dates for the next <coughs> You must be recommended by that board to attend the FedEx board. Results are published about 30 to 60 days after the board is typically quicker than that. A couple weeks typically is what I've seen. Um, once you're selected, you must commission within 24 months of that board date. So once you go to the flight board and that FedRec board, then you're maintained by the State Aviation Office on an OML. So an order of merit list. Um, and you attend school based off of where you're at on that list. And there's a lot of things that go into consideration uh, when you put on that list. So if you board and you are the top candidate and you just blew the board away, but you're getting married in March, like obviously if you can't go to that school date, then the number two person might go before you because of a life circumstance. flight school availability really kind of affects that as well. Just like Colonel Andy explained before, we only get so many spots. Um, we have aviators that are going through the WSCS program right now that will get a couple of spots for next year. So it's it's like a puzzle. There's, there's a lot of things that go into when you will leave for flight school. But you sit on that OML, and then once you get contact, you're like, hey, we've got a flight school spot for you, then you'll go to that federal recognition board and then on to your commissioning source, if you're a warrant, and then on to flight school. So the FedRec board is conducted once a month. The packets are due a week prior to the board. I build those packets. Uh, the completed NGB Form 62 ECHO is required. These are things, I'll be honest, that you really don't need to worry about until you're selected. And that's where I come into play pretty heavily. I walk you through that process because it's a big packet and uh, I've become pretty good at putting them, so I help you there. The uniform is OCP. The panel, again, consists of 06 and 3 to 5 senior warrants, and the results of that board are immediate. So you go to the board, uh, you'll, you'll walk out of the room, they'll discuss it, and they bring it back in and they say yes or no, we want you as an officer or a warrant officer. So, warrant officer application process, once you complete that FedRec board, then that's when you pick, you pin on the warrant officer candidate rank. Right? Um, and then you wait for training. So, warrant officers move into their new paragraph line number. So, as let's say you're in the engineers right now, and you get selected by the flight board, and you go to the FedRec board, you get recommended, they move you into that aviation paragraph and line number with the aviation battalion. And you will drill with them until you leave for flight school. As a <coughs> so training begins, uh, WOCS, post, SEER, and IERW. I cannot personally speak on any of those because I'm not an aviator, but uh, those are questions. If you have questions about those schools, when the, uh, the Q&A session, those are, that's the time to ask us questions about this. So WOCS, if that's the route that you want to go, there's two options. There's the RTI or there's federal WOCS. Aviators attend both. Um, the RTI, there's a phase zero, which is in March of every year. It's a state implemented phase 
not actually a requirement to graduate the VOCS, but that weekend prior to phase one prepares you for the beginning of WOCS, so you're not walking in the morning. Phase one is uh, it's just drill once a month. It's a unified from April through August. It's at the 185th RTI right here on Camp Dodge. When you begin in April, you'll take a, a PT test. Well, you used to. Uh, but you will do height and weight. So you have to pass that. If you don't, then um, there's no second chances. It's not like a typical Army school where you know if you fail, then they're like, okay, you got seven days, and then you get a second chance. It's, there's no second chances. Phase two of the RTI WOCS is two weeks at Camp Atterbury, Indiana in September. So at the end of those two weeks, then you commission as a WO1. Again, height, weight, and PT are record at that phase, whatever PT is record again. Federal WOCS is a consecutive five weeks spent at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Um, at the end of that five weeks, you commission as a W01. You may return to Iowa after you graduate, before you go to flight school. You may go straight through, just dependent on school dates um, and availability. Okay, so the officer application process, I'm going to let Major Clausen, uh, he's the officer strength manager, so he's, he's my boss on the full time side. He does all the officers, I do all the warrant officers. He's going to brief you on, on the timeline on the officer side. Yeah, so when you look at, good morning first off, when you look at the, the flow chart here, it says chief brief on the last one. A lot of the time I'm still the same. First, first thing being the SIP, I'm not going to repeat what you said. Take the SIP, pass the SIP, we'll move on from that point to the flight physical waivers, uh, the flight board process. Where I'm going to get more into the conversation is on the next slide. It's that process. That this is what I want to dig into. The actual way that you can commission as a commission officer within the Iowa National Guard. How many people in the room have a four-year degree? All right. All right. So those with your hands up for a four-year degree, you're already in OCS. You're already in OCS. So the four-year degree, folks, that Fed OCS program that you see there is an option for you. You have to have a four-year degree to attend federal OCS. You have to be under 35 years old. If, if that is, once you're selected, through which you take the SIP, once you've done the, the flight, does it go? Once you've done that whole process and then selected through the flight board, I can send you to federal OCS. It's 12 weeks at Fort Benning, Georgia, where we send you down and do 12 weeks straight there, you'll come back to commission. And then the SAO office, and, and uh, working with myself in the SAO office, they'll get you stay with your flight, for your flight school. Right? So that federal OCS piece, uh, I'll be around all day if you have questions. Those with the four degree, you're the ones that that option can apply to. How many people have at least 90 credit hours? So if you're a 90 credit hour or above, yet not at your four-year degree, we can talk uh, our, uh, the RTI OCS, or for those coming in the rest of you, I'm assuming are under 90 credit hours, so ROTC. So OCS through the state program, uh, if you also have the federal, or sorry, if you have the four-year degree, federal and state apply. But the thing when you look at the state program, it starts every April. Phase zero, a little different than the war officer side. Phase zero for us is three months long, April, May, June, right? So if you do show up that first weekend, you're going to take a, you're going to take an ACFT, some kind of physical fitness. While not for record, you're going to take it. You're going to take high weight. If you fail, you have three months before you should to phase one. Right? A little different maybe than that situation. But once you go to phase one, same thing. If you get there and you fail, you're sent home. We're not going to send you there to fail because we're not going to let you get sent back home. So phase zero, three months. There's the accelerated program and the traditional program. So the accelerated program is eight weeks in Fort uh, Meade, South Dakota. South Dakota. You get to go over there for eight weeks, you'll come back commission with the class that started the year prior to me. But again, you have to be, to do that program, you have to have already been selected through the flight board process. If you come in and say, I want to do, if don't come in April and say, I want to do accelerated and I want to be, it's, it's probably not going to happen. Unless you somehow like that March board and get selected, you have to hit those gates, right? You have to be selected by the flight board. Uh, and then the traditional program, you do phase zero for three months. It's two weeks in South Dakota, 11 months of one weekend a month, two weeks again back in South Dakota and your commission. Right? Throughout that process, if you haven't already been part of the aviation, like in the organization, having a mentor doing this process, that 16-month program is going to help give you the time to work with your mentors and, 
and really develop that relationship and have, and have success at the whiteboard. A great program for those of you that don't have a four-year degree, less than 90 credit hours or anywhere in there is ROTC as well. One, benefit, one great benefit about ROTC is when you start at you know, Iowa, Iowa State, UNI, Drake, Coe, Univista, uh, Grandview, uh, University of Dubuque, any of those pro where we offer the programs, the, uh, the SMP program with ROTC where you contract as a cadet, but on drill weekend, we're going to put you in one of those aviation units so you can spend the next four, three, two years. You've got to be a junior to start ROTC, so if you're already in that senior year, OCS is where I'm going to push you towards as far as my recommendation. Junior or below, I'm going to look at ROTC so that way you can, again, develop that relationship with your mentors to help give you success at that flight point. Um, there's a lot that goes into those three programs. I'm here all, I don't want to sit here and just dive into all of them. I'm here all day. During the breaks, or during any of the things, if you have specific questions on federal OCS, state OCS, or ROTC, come chat with me. I'll talk to you about the programs, where they're located, how it works when you're going to a cadet in that unit, how it works if I put you at the RTI. I think we have three OCS uh, candidates in the room today. Uh, please come chat with me if you have questions on where you're at in the process. But for those that are in OCS, every October is when I do the level five OCMB. So that's when you have to have your decision made what those branches are going to be. And we'll also talk, and since we have some of the mentors here, we'll talk about what is the next, uh, what's in select aviation, or what's the best branch after that in case it doesn't work out. Thanks, sir. So a lot of information. Right? Um, you know, I
your skill set, right? So it is significant in the sense it's about 100 hours you have to do a year flying. An aircraft, a helicopter flies about two hours on one bag of gas. You're not going to get that time under a weekend. You're going to get some under a weekend, but you're going to have to come in and do what we call AFTPs, additional flight training periods. Those AFTPs, you're getting paid, a full day's pay for one AFTP. But it's the expectation to come in and you manage that cycle. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit when I get another chance to speak here in a little bit. Uh, so, again, like if you live three hours from the flight facility and then you fly for, what, four hours? The minimum AFTP is four hours. Um, so what we're getting into is the safety thing. You know, uh, a 10 hour work day or six hour, you work eight hours a day and then it takes you three hours to drive to the flight facility. So I'm making new math, how many hours is that? 11, right? And then you want to go and fly a minimum of four hours and it takes you to 16 hours, you think it's safe. Then you got to drive home on the back side of that. Does that make sense? It doesn't work. That's what she's getting after right now. So we usually have, you know, you need to be about an hour from a flight facility to make it work. So things to consider. Uh, deployments, um, Carl Lane hit on that as well, about every 36 months. Uh, and the other thing to consider is your 15 to 18 month uh, flexible commitment. So you're, it's a PCS move, you take your family, but you are away from home for 15 to 18 months. And is that a commitment that you need to make? Here's the contact information. My name on there is wrong. Uh, our business cards are in your folders, so you don't need to write this down, but paper Clausen my business card are both in your folders. So if you have any questions regarding the commissioning side, you are welcome to contact people on us. Any questions on the timeline? Then is there, is there a preference? I know you talk about you know, puzzle between doing RTI or just going for doing your five weeks straight through. Is there a preference? Yeah. No, it's really about availability. It really is. I mean, uh, is the five weeks knock it out in flight school? I mean, I think most people would probably prefer that. However, we don't always have flight school spots available. So if you attend the RTI course, we can at least get you commissioned and then get you scheduled for flight school the next fiscal year. So it just keeps you, keeps you moving. Um, it takes longer, but at least you're still working towards that goal instead of just sitting there stagnant. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. All right, so really the last briefing that I'm going to give you today is how to build a flight packet. In your folders, there's two checklists. There's a warrant officer checklist and there's an officer checklist. And these checklists are very similar, but, but they're slightly different. So please, and it's just at the very top in the blue, it'll either say officer or warrant officer. So there's other versions of the checklist that we have updated as the years have gone by to make them more efficient. You want to make sure if you're going the warrant officer right route that you have the checklist dated February 7th of 2021. And if you're going the officer route, we just updated this last week or this week. So what's the date on it? June, June of 21. Ignore the slide. That's not the most up-to-date. The one you have in your packet right now, dated June 2021, is the most up-to-date for the officer side. So the, the presentation of your packet is a big deal. This is not a stack of papers that you hand over. It is not a digital copy. It is a physical packet that you have to turn into the state aviation office, and it should be professional, and it should be organized, and it should look like you put a lot of time and effort um, suggestions, there is there is no, this is what the front of it has to look like, or you have to use a white binder. There's there's no requirements like that, but we would suggest paint protectors, green binders, tabs, 
have people look through it, make sure it's free of grammatical errors, and that it's organized, the table of contents, it's easy to find all the documents, um, the color copies of your awards, school certificates always look nicer, and then you need to make sure all your documents are legible. So, and we're gonna go through, we're gonna go through what those documents are, but if you turn in a, an Insta VR and you can't even read it, that's gonna be an issue. So you wanna make sure all the documents you put in there are easy to read and look nice. So the warrant officer checklist, <coughs> that date on there is outdated. It should be 2021, February 7th. It's really broken down into four phases. There's phase one, which is your initial steps. Um, it's the interview and the counseling where you're assigned a mentor. Phase two and three list all the documents that are required for your flight work packet. This is the presentation that this presentation that I'm giving you right now really focuses on phase two and three, building that packet, what it should look like. Uh, and step four is the steps that you're going to take after your packet is complete. Same thing with the officer checklist. It, it's the same thing. Phase one, initial steps, interview. Phase two and three are the documents. For steps. All right, so packet building SIFT. Uh, the SIFT, the results are provided to you as soon as you take the test. You walk away with a copy of the results. Um, you want to keep a copy of that for your flight board packet. Uh, your flight physical, uh, you can get a copy of that from the State Aviation Office or myself or Sergeant Bonnie Rod, who is manages the flight physicals. You want to make sure you fill in the date it was taken and the date you're qualified on that checklist that's provided. Moral and medical waivers, if applicable, get a copy approved from me or the State Aviation Office. Um, and again, like I said, if you need an age waiver, that's done after the flight board. Security clearance memo, uh, you can use a JCAS printout, uh, which you can get from your full-time staff in your unit. You can also request a security clearance memo through your SharePoint site, that's the link right there, or you can call them at 4420. Letter from the applicant. So uh, Colonel Lampy, I know you want to touch on this a little bit, uh, but this is this is the letter that states why you want to be an aviator. Uh, it's supposed to be completed in a memorandum format. Obviously, make sure it's free grammatical errors, that you read it, that it sounds good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit like a bigger overarching topic that gets to this point. All right. So as you become an officer, you now manage, manage your own career. All right. You're taking a step away from where you're at now, whatever position you're in, E5, E6, or, or specialist or whatever. You manage your career as an officer. All right. You're gonna have to write memorandums. You're gonna have to write documents, and writing is important. This is to get after that piece. The other piece is we want to understand, you know, who you are, what you are through that mentorship program. You're going to put it in words why you want to be an Army aviator. Oh, it looks really neat to fly a helicopter. It looks challenging. We've seen them all, right? That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to articulate where you see yourself in 10 years, where you see yourself in 15 years, why this is going to help you become the human that you want to be, the leader that you want to be. Does that make sense? This isn't, you know, I'm looking for a challenge. It looks really cool and, and uh, you know, um, I was on the battlefield or I was deployed in, in, in Army Aviation flew in and it excited me. That's part of it. That's part of what gets after that, right? But it's more than that. Okay, so we're getting after who's written a memorandum before. There's an AR associated with that. Follow the AR. So how do you resource, how do you understand, and how do you develop? When you're, a, when you're an officer, this gets into the bigger thing I'm talking about. It's desire. I'm looking for desire. You know, you put yourself in my shoes. We're different than the other branches of warrant officer and officer in a sense. The commissioning service warrant officer is typically a technical warrant, not an aviator technical warrant. There's prerequisites you have to, to accomplish. You have to be an E5 or E6 for so long. You have to have a certain MOS. Aviation has none of that because we're going to teach you everything you need to know at flight school and when we come back to flight school, we continue that education. We are going to teach you. We have to then figure out at the state level who's the right person to go to flight school. 
This is a competition, but it's also um, about you as a, like I said, developing yourself. That's a challenge for us, all right? And where we see the challenges and how we try to sift that through is put yourself in our shoes. It, it, thinking that flight school is going to be fun, thinking that you know it's really cool to fly an aircraft is not going to get you through through SEER school. It's not. SEER's not easy. This flight packet, the whole process of the packet is about desire. There's a lot of people that start this, and I, I, if you sat down with me as an individual, I don't do those interviews as much anymore. These guys in the back of the room do. If you sat down with me, I would tell you, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing this packet process. Most of the people back here went through uh, the same type of thing, but went through mentorship with me, uh, specifically, selected for flight school. In this room right now, the average is going to be about 2 or 3% of you are going to finish this process. Self-selection there. It's not an easy process. And I'm looking for desire because 10 years from now, when you have your MSO, is that right? Yes, sir. All right. So your MSO now, right? There were six years. It moved to, moved to 10. It's not, it shouldn't be a hiccup. To me, that if you, if you set flight school in front of me 21 years ago now, it didn't matter to me if I had an MSO of six years or 10 years. I wanted to do this, and I wanted to have a career. This is where I wanted to be. Does that make sense? That's what we're looking for. Because to come into the flight facility once a week to fly, to get your hours, to get through SEER school, to have a career, that's what this is about. Does that make sense? And this is where your chance to articulate it. We're also building in, hey, can you reference regulation? Can you write appropriately associated with that? Does that make sense? I have to, we have to as a board, sift through and figure out who the right candidates are. This is one way to do it. That makes sense. The board process for this specific letter, we look at this. If you want to know one thing, there's, step, there's like four things that I have to look at. If you build this packet, if we were to go back to that last brief and you talked about, you know, the flight school board, the mentorship program is going to help you build this packet. They're not going to do it for you. You ask questions to that mentor, they're going to help you because they've done it, right? So they've done the packet. But this is what gets you to the FedRec board for aviation. This packet. And everything you do for this packet will help you fill out that um, FedRec board packet. It's everything you need for that. But this is, this is separate from that. Okay, so this is like the step one of it. When this packet's completed and the mentor recommends you, which has to happen, the mentor recommends you to go to the, full, go to the flight school board, that's where you sit amongst the board members and, and we interview you that final process, all right? This packet is your first impression to that board member. So that board member doesn't know you. That board member, that's me, I'm the president of the board, but the other facility commanders or someone else, you might, you're probably gonna know that facility commander through that mentorship program, but you're gonna know one person on that board and everybody else isn't gonna know you. That packet shows up, they're gonna go to this letter, they're gonna start there, they're gonna look at PT, they're gonna look at NCOERs, they're gonna read your comments and your NCOERs. This is important. Sorry to take so much time. Yep. So on the on the slide there, you see that it says AR 25-50. Just a little tip of it. Updated one of uh, October 2020. There's brand new out there, so make sure you grab the current one and use that as a reference. Because things did change in the past. All right, so the next thing on that checklist is the resume. This is Warren Officer Center Specific. There is not a specific format required for the officer checklist. Uh, I do have examples and white copies in my office. Uh, this resume takes time. Uh, it is not a form that you can just fill out in a couple hours. It should be presented in chronological order, free of grammatical errors, um, and again, dated within 12 months. So this form goes through all of your military experience and assignments, civilian, Experience and every military school you've been to. And it's not just a, a school name and a date. There's, there's a description you have to add in there as well. So uh, this is time consuming, but does help give the board an overview of where you've been in your career. Biographical summary. Again, we have templates available. Everything should be in chronological order. Everything on this should match your packet. So whatever is on your ERB, your resume, uh, your biographical summary, it all should match. All the dates, all the schools, everything you're saying should be consistent. 
drugs packing. Your enlisted record brief, uh, this thing should be impeccable. It should be completely up to date. Get with your full-time staff and unit personnel to make those corrections. Uh, DA photos are no longer required. They were for E6 and above anyway, but now it's it's not a requirement at all. So you don't have to worry about that piece. Uh, but they do need to be validated within 12 months of the board by you. There's a difference. Your unit can certify your ERB. Not good enough. It has to be validated by you. Answer errors, OERs, provide all copies of all of them, no matter how far they get back. Make sure you don't have any rating gaps. So if you are an NCO and you've got a two, three month rating gap in there, that needs to be fixed before you go in front of the board. Again, chronological orders, any answer ERs or OERs with a negative rating will be addressed in the board. I would strongly suggest you address those prior to that anyway. Um, you can't hide it going to be addressed, you might as well be the first one to do it anyway. APFT, ACFT, and high grade data. So back when things made sense, there was, uh, you had to have it within a year, or eight months if you're APR. Again, this is your packet. There is not a requirement for a record PT test at the moment. However, if this is what you want to do, a diagnostic is going to speak volumes because at least you're showing where you're at on physical fitness. Again, can't force you to do one, but it's your packet. You can make it as good or as bad as you want it to. Your most current height and weight does need to be within six months of the board date, and if you have to be taped, you need to provide that body fat worksheet. Uh, we do ask for historical, a minimum of the last five years for both, um, and it needs to come from DTMS, which I can pull for your full-time unit staff can pull that data. College transcripts, they must be official transcripts. Make sure the most recent is in your iPerms. Again, that feeds into your ERB, so if that information is not up to date, you need to get those in there, not just for this, but Motion wise, on the enlisted side, you should have those in there. So make sure you turn those into your full time unit staff to get that into your iPerms and that it's annotated correctly on your ERB. Whether you're going officer or warrant officer, you still have to turn in your college transcripts. So if you're going the warrant officer route, we know it's not a requirement, but if you have college, whether you have a degree or four credit hours because you took one class, those have to be turned in. Training and leadership certificates, again, presented in chronological order, starting with the most current. Make sure they are legible. Sometimes those copies in your iPerms look kind of jankety. They don't scan right or they just don't read well. Make sure you put in legible copies um, and include the important and training leadership uh, certificates. So 1059s, 214s, and to be form 22. We do not need your defensive driving course or your cyber awareness. Like we all, we all know, we all do those. We're talking significant uh, certificates here. So not that we don't appreciate you doing those courses, we just don't need to see it. Awards, again, chronological order by date, with the most current, make sure these are legible include the key important awards. Again, um, you know, your service awards are nice, but we're looking for key awards. Your AMs, RCOMs, things that you've accomplished. Personal documents are required in this packet, which includes your birth certificate, your social security card, your driver's license. Make sure they are legible. Make sure your driver's license is not expired. And uh, this is not on here, but your social security card needs to be signed. If it's not signed, it won't get you back. Your 62 ECHO, which is your application for federal recognition. So here's the deal with this form. This form is not really uh, a key component in the flight board process, 
but this is the document that you need to attend the February report. And uh, so it is important, but on the back end. So if you get recommended and we need you to go to the FedRec board the very next month and the packet's due in a week, this form takes time and it's very detail oriented. I have yet to have anybody turn in a 62 echo that I didn't kick back for corrections. So take that as a challenge. I would love to get one where, where it doesn't need to be fixed. But what I'm saying is that it's done prior to the flight board, so if there's a tight timeline and we need to turn you around and get you to that bed right board, that this, this form is already done. I have a template and an example that I can send to you uh, that makes it easier to fill it out. But again, one of those documents that just takes more than five minutes to do. Your statements of understanding. Uh, templates, again, through our office, you have two years to complete flight school once you appoint, and you accrue that 10-year service obligation at the completion of IERW. These two documents uh, essentially tell you that you acknowledge those requirements. But that's saying, from, my, from that point, I have to start and then flight school within two years? You have to start. Totally okay, start flight school. Yes. Okay. So the biggest difference is the packets are really the letters of recommendation when I talk between a warrant officer and an officer. Uh, warrant officer letters of recommendation have to be completed on this USA Red form. Uh, they should be three to five paragraphs, quantifiable. It talks about your character, your competence, you know, what you've done in your career. These should not, should not, should not be generic. I don't know how many times I can say that. They get turned in all the time or it looks like they pull something off the internet and just copy and paste it. These have to have some thought into it. And your commanders are busy. They're busy people. So I would suggest that you provide some of that content. Here, sir, here, ma'am, here's a, here's a list of all the things that I've done and the reasons why I think I should be an aviator so they can pull that information and help write that letter of recommendation quicker and better. Uh, than it probably would have been before. So please keep that in mind when you ask for your letters of recommendation. Your company commander letter of recommendation does require the following statement. It's a PT height weight statement. Again, that PT statement is going to be dated 2019. We know that. We realize that. Uh, it's just the way it is at this point. But you do want to make sure that height and weight does match the most part that you have here. Senior warrant letter of recommendation uh, comes from a CW3 to CW5. This is typically your mentor. So when you start the process and you get assigned a mentor at the boot facility, that's the aviator that's going to write your letter. Point of contact information is required on every letter of recommendation. So a phone number and an email of the person writing them needs to be included and they have to be signed within 12 months of the board date. Uh, officer letters of recommendation, uh, company commander is minimum, your unit, battalion, or brigade commander uh, recommendation letter. Who's boss? Did you walk out? What's your question? So it's minimum is unit commander. So you just want yep. company commander. Yep. Minimum yeah. is that. Okay. Again, minimum. So I tell you this on the warrant officer side too. I love if you have a civilian employer, your civilian employer is right write a letter of recommendation. What's that tell me? It tells me that you've communicated with your civilian employer and they know the process and you probably talked to them about 18 months being away, that type of stuff. We're not, this is minimum requirements, all right? It's your packet. Make sense? All right. So uh, officer letter of recommendation still requires that PT statement in there. Same thing with point of contact information, must be dated in the months. So after your packet is complete, uh, you want to make sure it's reviewed by your mentor. Make sure it's turned in to the state aviation office by the due date. And then you coordinate the board date with your mentor. Um, dates are up there, obviously. You already have those. And I know, I know 
Colonel maybe hit on this already, but I want to emphasize that, again, your mentor and myself and any of the other aviators, we will not hold your hand through this process. We are not going to call you and say, where are you at? Where are you at? What are you doing? Where are you packing at? It's not going to happen. There's no hand holding here. This is all about initiative. They want to see that you have the initiative, that you take the time to do this, and that you take it seriously. However, we are here to help you. We're not going to turn you away. If you call us and you're like, I don't know where to find this document, or I don't, can you proofread this, or can you do this, can you do this? Absolutely. We're here to help. But it's got to be initiated by you. It has to come from you. We are not going to drag you along the process because that's not the type of individual that uh, Colonel Lamb is looking for to be on this team. So please keep that in mind. Huge resource. If I don't know, I know who does know. So you can always come to me. But again, your mentor is one of those individuals as well. And if they don't know, then usually they call me and then we figure it out. So don't be afraid uh, to use those resources. Any questions on the flight packet? Come on, there's got to be a question. Not this good. isn't, this is where we My struggle the most. that right? good. So bottom line, the flight packet is really, right, it builds the 62E. Everything in there, is, there's a purpose for everything, okay? There's a purpose for everything. The biographical summary, you need to have that for the rest of your career. You need to learn to become an officer now. When do you learn to become an E6? When you're an E5, right? When do you learn to become an E5, when you're an E4? If you want to become an officer, these are things that you have to do. So we're not going to um, make you do something that isn't going to further your career, right? So this whole packet that we have for aviation is because we're looking for you to aspire to emulate the officer that you want to be right now. All those documents are needed and it's going to help you. I will reiterate what she said. All of the people in the back of the room are very busy people. They want to mentor you. We need you to be a part of the program. But I need people that are self-starters, have initiative, and get after things because eight years from now when you're back in flight school and you're flying and you have to come into the facility, the people in the back of the room aren't going to call you and say, hey, Gerber, you're, you're short, you're at you know, 80 hours, I need you to get to 96, I need you to come in and fly. I need you to be knocking on the door saying, I'm ready to go fly, I need you, you want to be there. I need people that want to be here, that want to be a part of the program. And I, did, I got to tell you, we're selective because we have that that's the type of organization you're wanting to join. Everybody in the in those flight units want to be there. And they're always doing more and being part of a program that's asking a lot of you. We understand that, but you gotta have the, the initiative and desire to be there. This packet is part of that initiative and desire. You can get through this packet, you can get through the hurdles, that's the first step, right? There's hurdles throughout your whole career and your whole life, right? This isn't a hurdle there just to put a hurdle in front of you, it's to help you prepare for those responsibilities as you get further down in your officer career. And we need you, I want you to get through that. But this is also self-eliminating. A lot of people, because it's difficult, there's a process here, it's difficult, it's not that hard. It also helps us self-eliminate people that don't really have that desire. Bottom line up front. Okay? Thanks, sir. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're waiting on duty jobs, the liver lunch. So they should be here any minute. Um, once the food's here, and we're going to ask you guys to sit back down, we're going to start the Q&A session. Until then, you can just kind of just take a break and we'll all start. Sorry. I a question about the, uh, hold on, hold on. So I have a question about the commander's recommendation letter. Yeah. Do you have it down for the ATFG? Is that going to be for the ACFG? Right now, the last record that anybody has on file is from 2019. So it's the ATFT. Alright. Are, are we switching that for like this? Are we doing the training year or physical year for the switch? To the ACFT? Yeah. Until that's I've heard them pushing that back a second time or third time, whatever it is now. Until oh. that's an actual record test, you're gonna put the 2019 APFT record right. in that statement. Right. That, that's a qualifying thing, right? You have to have it again. We're not asking for something that doesn't that we don't need. That's a qualifying thing for FedRec. Yeah. 
But I can tell you, when you go down to flight school, I'm really looking at people for 22 right now. 21 is pretty full, right? Doesn't mean I, I can't get somebody in there, but 21 is, is, is a challenge. I'm really looking ahead to so next year. 22. You're going to be taking the ACFT while you're at flight school. And I will tell you, at flight school, there's phases of flight school. These people will talk to you about phases of flight school. When I was down there at flight school, you know, I took six AP, AP or that, that time it was APFTs. Six APFTs for record for each phase that I went through at take a TT test. The ACFT, is, there's a lot more to it, right? There's a lot more uh, administrative things to get through, like putting the, putting the field together and all that stuff. These guys will be able to answer those questions for you. But you can imagine, you're going to take several ACFT tests while you're down. Bottom line. Okay? So if you haven't done that, this is why we're asking you. She talked about it. She kind of put stuff and said, hey, it would be nice for you to make sure you have a diagnostic one so you know where you're at. It's going to come into play. We're going to ask you. We're going to look for it. Go so, ahead. so you're saying if you're trying to set that pattern for diagnostic ACF or EP test, look probably towards the ACFT. That's where we be taking flight school. That's, that's the pattern you want to see Absolutely. at this point. We'll be APFT. That's great. But yeah. Let's move on. We want to set you up for success. Yes, sir. All right. I'll tell you that. There's really three things that, that get people um, in this process, right? There's three things that knock people out of flight school uh, or don't uh, knock you out of the process and even get through the application process. Or while you're down at flight school or after flight school you come back. And you probably all know what they are. Number one is PT, right? People, people throughout their career get, um, don't, aren't able to continue their, their ACFT or PT test, right? So prior to, it's a disqualifier. Right? It's a disqualifier. I need people that are physically and healthy fit or healthy and fit in the aircraft. Wow, that, that has to happen, right? There's a lot of physiology you're gonna learn about this stuff, but fit people are better pilots, alright? Number one. Number two, so PT is a, is, a, is a disqualifier, right? And it happens after you get back to flight school too. You have to maintain it. So even after you're taking ACFT, you don't get promoted promotions based on that, right? Based on your qualification. As, or your, your uh, I call it your personal standards, right? In addition to uh, all the other things you get rated on as an officer, right? In this case, as a warrant officer flying the aircraft. As an officer that's flying the aircraft and leading your leadership ability. Warrant officers is that as well, by the way. It's, we're all leaders, you're officers. All right, so PT is the number, number one issue that we have. At flight school, prior to flight school, um, in Iowa, we've had this many people sent home for PT. We've had this many people send home from flight school because we, we do a really good job. This process, what we do is vetted. There's success. Been doing it for, uh, I told you, I started the battalion OIC in 2004. We've been doing this process since 2004. We don't have people come back from flight school because we prep you. We make sure that you're the right person and you're ready to go. That should, that should give you some, uh, some confidence in, in our program and our process, all right? So PT. National Guard Bureau last year had zero people sent home from flight school. They measured by state, by number, by who, who comes. And you know, get very few flight school seats nationally. You can't waste them. Does that make sense? You can't waste them. I already know if you're going to flight school for me, what unit you're going to go to, and that unit's probably in a boat cycle. By the time you come back, we try to make it so that you're coming back from flight school, you spend a year or so going through progression, and then you're off on a deployment where you're going to get a lot of good experience. You're filling holes right now. I know where those are at. Working with the warrant officers, working with the officers, we know where those are at. Okay, so so PT, what do you think the second one is? Come on, we got smart people in here. Moral issues, making bad decisions. And I'm going to close, but making bad decisions is about character. I told you we're here about building leaders, we're here about knowing who you are. This is part of the mentorship program. What we're looking for. So making bad decisions could be a whole bunch of things. Excessive uh, you know, speeding tickets and, and that kind of shows a pattern, right? Or not following rules. Worst case, alcohol drugs. Alcohol being the number one, all right? There's no room for it. There's no room for it. Not only in the, it's a, it's a trust issue between the FAA and us, that your license is really through the FAA, but it's through us, through the military, right? And FAA, if you get an OWI, you lose your, you lose your flight certificate. Right? You get an OWI as a pilot, you're done for us. It's a trust issue. That makes sense. So I will tell you that character, we talk about, not to get too much into detail, character is about virtues. 
Virtues are things that you do consistently because they become a pattern, a pattern right? When we're looking for good, you, you think about virtues, you think about moral character, you guys think about making good decisions, ethical decisions, moral, right? Being a good person. There's more to it than that. It's being a good soldier. It's setting yourself to be in the right position. It's making sure that you're not putting yourself in a bad position. All of you need to think about it. Outside the guard, the person that you are outside the guard, when you take this uniform off, is the person you are when you're in the guard. If you're making bad decisions because no one's watching or because the guard isn't there and you're out there in the civilian side and making bad decisions, that's the same person when you put the uniform on that you are in the uniform. On the other side of that, good moral character, ethics, someone that's you know, doing the right things outside the guard, is that the person that's the same person in the guard. So looking on the positive side. That's our challenge, is figuring out who you are, making sure that you're going to fit. We're looking for those things. I don't have, we don't have the luxury of making many mistakes in aviation. We need to limit that. Does that make sense? So moral character is the, is the second one. I'll just stop there, all right? Third one's a combination, all right, of, of different things. So I'm just, it, it really is. Everybody in this room, I congratulate you for being here. But I will tell you, whether you go become an aviation officer or a, or a war officer technical or an officer in a different MOS, or just continue on your careers in NCO, think about that. Character and virtues can be learned, but it has to be through you. You have to start putting yourself in the right position. You have to make sure you limit your risk in positions. And you're young, a lot of you are young, all right? None of us over here are gonna, are gonna tell you that we haven't been there before, been in that position, okay? You, you gotta really be careful about what positions you put yourself in. That makes sense. All right, so desire, character, PT, all big things that we're looking for. Sounds like a food here. It looks like food here. So, um, I would like the junior aviators to come up front. They're going to sit up here. This is your time to ask them those questions about flight school, process, whatever you want. Um, you guys can file in the back and grab one and then sit right back down so we can get the Q&A started. There are two vegetarian sandwiches if you want to <laughs> There's one that's not marked with a number, so I'm going to hold it. That's okay. So, anyway, grab a sandwich, grab some chips, there's bottled water in the back, and then you can sit right back. Okay.